sustainability linked bonds since the beginning of 21, doubling that amount which we raised, I think, in 2020. Yet, reports suggest that since 2018, green bonds have constituted only a 0.7% of all the bonds that were issued in India. We need to iron out the challenges by generating an awareness around green and sustainable borrowing, offer support measures to overcome hesitation to launch sustainable issuances, increase sector diversification in the green bond market issuances. I'm sure SEBI is already thinking of such measures. Issuers need in under to understand, they need help in understanding what is green, what is green across different asset classes in industry. This would actually make a long way in making them comfortable with industry-specific approach to raising green finance. Here I must add, SEBI is not alone. Even the note by the Reserve Bank of India in January 21 exudes confidence towards India's greener and sustainable long-term economic growth. Concessional lending. Given the onslaught of the pandemic, it has been considerate of RBI to take measures toward addressing liquidity, and we have ample liquidity, and expanding the scope of what constitutes private sector. RBI can deepen the domestic corporate green bond markets by holding green bonds itself and reducing and requiring commercial bonds uh, banks to do so uh, the same way as they do under the SLR, the statutory liquidity ratio, under, this, under that requirements, if they can be also covered. In order to attract foreign capital flows, it is so crucial to overcome hurdles around the deepening long tenure and accelerate sustainable investments via the ECB route, as well the FPI and the FDI route. A diversified mix of investors and a diversified type of capital will allow sustainable finance ecosystem to flourish. Let us all be very clear. Sustainable finance drives economic growth. This is according to a June uh, publication. It provides a potential to create 18 million jobs by 2030. And I think that's what we need so much in India. And that, that's including the inevitable job losses due to fossil fuel. For India to capture a growing share of the global sustainable inflows, it will require all of us, all of us to lean forward and participate, not by the force of regulation, but by conviction and integrity. This leads me to my second point, corporate governance. The G in the ESG. In the past, investors, investors would be more inclined towards investing in companies with high rates of returns, as we all know. But today they have realized that beyond financial drivers, non-financial parameters play an equally important role in improving their return to capital on capital. Stewardship displayed by the board of directors contributes significantly towards the sustainable outlook of a company, the sector it operates in, and our economy as a whole. It all adds up. I think many of you may know that HDFC published its corporate governance report far before it was mandated. We started publishing it from, 20, uh, from 2000, 2001. Stakeholders, especially investors and ESG rating agencies look into the key aspects of governance of any organization as the following. What is the business purpose and how well is it aligned to ESG? For example, you know, when at our group, if I can talk for 30 seconds on our group, uh, we, are, uh, the, we are today driven by three really issues, which is diversity, financial inclusion, and inclusion of, of, of all types of, you know, uh, people across income strata, through banking, housing solutions, asset management, life and gender insurance products. What do investors otherwise look at? They look at the board composition by skills, by independency, by diversity. These are critical enablers to judge the board's competency as well as gauge its ability to perform. I think uh, we at HDFC, uh, the role between the MD and CEO uh, we had from 2010, you know, we had separated it. Similarly, if you look at my company, where I'm coming from, HDFC Limited, we have 20% of our women uh, of directors are women directors. In HDFC Life, it's even better. 27% there is a women diversity on its board. Then the third thing they look at is material risk oversight. 
How are boards addressing risk and opportunities from rapidly evolving technology, including cybersecurity, digitalization of their businesses, climate change? I think all these things have become a very, very important part of all the board agendas that we look at it. And I think the proof really lies, you know, in the fact that uh, many of us companies, and I'm sure there are many here who have won the award and, uh, and thank you so much IOD. You actually gave us an award last year, the Golden, Golden Peacock Award uh, for 2020-20. So this brings me really to the last point, which of course I, I which should really leave it to uh, Mr. Singh, but is the point on the BRSR. Global and domestic investors seeking to allocate earmarked green and sustainable monies, they need transparency and they need evidence on sustainable endeavors. There is a big ask today from all investors to address greenwashing, false claims of environmental and social compliance. As a first step in this direction, SEBI successfully implemented the sustainability disclosure requirements by introducing the BRR the Business Responsibility Report in 2012. Last year, SEBI established the Stewardship Code for mutual funds and the alternative investment funds. And after industry consultations to which even we at HDFC responded, announced the new Business Responsibility and Sustainability Report, the BRSR, that will be mandatory for all companies to be filed from 2022-23. Some of us are actually going to do it this year. The updated version <clears throat> will address stakeholders' need for greater transparency in the disclosures of ESG-related information as it incorporates actually not just words, but quantitative ESG metrics. Indian, Indian regulators have been equally ferocious in upgrading existing regulations to make them more ESG-aligned. Various amendments around risk committees, Timely and mandatory disclosures are aimed at harmonizing certain provisions of the LODR regulations with the Companies Act. Such measures and provisions by a regulator shows how committed they are towards the transition of India's growing economy to being a more responsible, environmentally conscious, socially inclusive, and well-governed engine of prosperity. So Rome was not built in a day, as they say. And we all would agree that the sustainable transition of our economy is not a destination, but a journey. And as we go ahead, it will revolve. But it is a journey that needs capital, which may be scarce and precious. Therefore, we have to be very sure-footed that we don't fritter it away. Thank you so much. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, Renuji. Thank you very Thank you. much. You have actually covered all the aspects of ESG so well and uh, laid the path ready for Amarjeet Singh Ji to take yeah, over. The expert. And uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Renuji, we look forward to your continued you. support. And we would very much like to uh, see your contributions and your support at IOD and many other functions that we do in program. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to invite Amar Singh, Amarjeet Ji. Uh, Mr. Amarjeet Singh is executive director at SEBI and he will deliver his uh, inaugural keynote address as well. SEBI managers on BRSR has given an in, a first mover advantage to India in corporate governance globally. We are not only courtesy SEBI, courtesy Mr. Amarjeet Singh Ji. My privilege to host. Uh, guest of honor, Mr. Amarjeet Singh Ji. He has been part of many vital decisions during his distinguished career at SEBI for the last 25 years. Extensive experiences in regulation and security. He is now executive director in charge of corporate finance department dealing with primary market reforms, issuance and listing of securities, corporate governance, corporate restructuring, delisting, etc. He also heads the Department of Economic Policy and Analysis at SEBI. He had his teeth founded in the Northern Region Office of SEBI. Later on, he was the 
uh, heading the front office of chairman, which is the most important position in uh, SEBI and uh, as his executive assistant and also the office of international affairs. He has been involved in very, very uh, international regulatory initiatives and uh, he represents SEBI as part time member of the board of national finance reporting and the board of governors of Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs. During 1719, he was on the board of National Institute of Securities Markets, uh, NIMSM, an institute founded by SEBI. He has represented SEBI on numerous committees set up by RBI, Government of India. His recent nomination on such committees include member of co investment committee set up by RBI in 2019. Of committee set up by Ministry of Corporate Affairs on corporate social responsibility and also insolvency law committee, an MBA, and also holds master's degree in economic policy management from Columbia University, New York, USA. He is a member of Indian Advisory Board, Newcastle University Business School, UK. He is a recipient on of a Rotary Foundation Educational Award for promoting leadership development and international understanding by Rotary International US. Over to you, sir, Amarji ji, please. We look forward to your words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. And, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be a part of this event. And I uh, sincerely thank the Institute of Directors for inviting me. Uh, let me, you know, begin with the obvious, uh, and I'm sure you've heard it already many times, a lot is happening in the sustainability space today. So climate change, uh, inclusive growth, and transitioning to a sustainable economy, uh, as Ms. Kannad also mentioned, they have emerged as major issues globally. Uh, investors and other stakeholders are seeking greater accountability from corporates on sustainability issues. And I think, uh, what has changed in the last one and a half years that this movement towards uh, sustainability issues has gathered pace thanks to COVID-19. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm still learning on sustainability issues and I'm not sure how much can I really add value to your knowledge, but I've been asked to speak on BRSR and I'm comfortable in that space, you know, having worked on developing that framework over the last year and a half or so. So what I would like to do uh, in the next 10 minutes or so is to give you a broad overview of the BRSR, including the background, um, our approach and thinking while developing this framework. Uh, I think importantly from the audience perspective, I would also like to talk about uh, what are the expectations from the company boards when it comes to disclosures particularly. And, uh, but before I do that, you know, just to set the context, let me talk a little bit about sustainable investing. Although Ms. Kannad again, you know, uh, gave a very comprehensive overview of uh, uh, the trends in sustainable investments. But let me, you know, talk more from the asset management industry point of view. So the, the, uh, what we are seeing, you know, globally and also in India, the increased focus on sustainability issues is actually getting reflected. It is not just an empty talk. Actually, it is also getting translated into action. And there is an evidence that we should take note of. So talking about the asset management industry, uh, there is substantial increase in the total assets and inflows in sustainable funds globally. Uh, and the COVID-19, as I said, has given a renewed boost to sustainable investing. So just to give you a couple of data points on the global side first. So globally, the total assets in sustainability funds increased from USD 550 billion at the beginning of 2018 to USD 960 billion at the end of 2019 and USD 1.65 trillion at the end of December 2020. And mind you, you know, 20 was a COVID year, despite that you see such a massive jump uh, of almost, you know, if you see, if you compare 
the increase from 20, beginning of 2018 to the end of 2020, you see a jump of 200 percent. So from 550 billion, the figure is 1.6 trillion US dollars. Talking about India, again, you know, we have some very interesting trends on the asset management side. So it's interesting to note that out of the nine, today we have nine ESG themed funds. Out of these nine, seven were launched after January 2020. So only in, during the last uh, slightly more than one year. In fact, in the last quarter of 2020, ESG fund assets in India doubled from the previous quarter to USC 1.3 billion. But if you compare, you know, this 1.3 billion with the global assets, uh, we, we are 0.08% of the global assets in sustainable funds. So we still have a long way to go there. But I think it's not the numbers which are important. It is the trends which are important. So what has been the response? What has been the regulatory response to these trends? Let me talk about that. So, so there are two main driving forces in the ESG world. One, of course, is the investors who are pushing for ESG investing and also seeking greater accountability from companies they invest in. Second is the governments and regulators like us. Uh, while as a regulator, we may be agnostic, you know, to where the investors choose to invest, we don't want to guide uh, in any particular area as such, but we have an important role to play in the area of ESG disclosures. And secondly, in the area of uh, mis-selling or greenwashing, uh, are you actually an ESG fund or, you know, or are you true to the label? You know? so, so that's the issue. And also keeping an eye that the ESG bubble doesn't develop you know, in the name of ESG. So uh, we are increasingly uh, witnessing greater push on ESG disclosures from regulators world over. We are not only ones, a number of regulators are active in this space now. As Ms. Kannad already mentioned, uh, we had introduced BRR for top 100 companies way back in 2012, and which was progressively extended to top 500 district companies in 2015 and top 1000 in 2019. In 2017, we had also introduced voluntary adoption of integrated reporting by top 500 companies. So what is the background to BRSR? You know, global developments uh, such as Paris Accord, uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, and the increasing focus on sustainability issues, uh, they have, you know, led to a review of the BRR. And uh, so what we did, we, we had a very intensive stakeholder consultation. We also, just to give you a sense of the process we followed, uh, and, and this was quite a rigorous process that we followed. Uh, we had intensive engagement with all the stakeholders. We also benchmarked ourselves with international standards, some of the known international standards. And after all that, we had come up with, uh, you know, this uh, new report called BRSR. And how is it different from BRR? It lays considerable emphasis on quantifiable metrics, uh, which allows uh, easier measurement and comparability. And also, you know, the disclosures on climate and social issues have been significantly enhanced. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues was telling me who worked as a part of this team that there are over 700 data points in the BRSR framework. So uh, let me now talk a little bit about our approach while developing this framework. So, you know, we decided we, we didn't simply want to copy the West. I mean, whatever is there in US, Europe, just pick it up. Uh, we, we wanted, we very consciously, you know, <clears throat> thought that let's look at our ground realities and then adapt ourselves, our requirements. So in terms of, uh, you know, uh, our ground reality, if I can talk a little bit about that, uh, as we all know, we've been one of the fastest, India has been one of the fastest growing economies in the past few years. 
However, we have huge challenges in terms of social disparities and income inequalities. So India still ranks 131 among 189 countries in the 2020 Human Development Index. Actually, the position has worsened compared to 2019. We were 129 or 130, so we've actually gone down one notch. Uh, similarly, if you look at the Inclusive Development Index of the World Economic Forum, our ranking is at 62nd place among 74 emerging countries. So this, this clearly shows that we have a long way to go. So therefore, why I'm mentioning all of this, we very consciously followed a climate plus approach. Climate, of course, there's no dispute uh, while working out the BRSR. So our disclosures are not only limited to environmental related metrics, but also include reporting on quantitative social metrics such as workforce diversity, health and safety of employees, employee engagement, welfare measures, social impact assessment of projects, uh, you know, the CSR spending in aspirational districts, and who are the beneficiaries of those CSR projects, et cetera. Uh, Climate-related disclosures, again, we've been ambitious there as well. They include data on energy consumption, water withdrawal and consumption, air emissions, scope one, scope two, uh, and air pollutant emissions, waste management. So, so it's a fairly comprehensive uh, framework. And importantly, let me also add, BRSR also seeks a disclosure of financial implications of climate-related risks and opportunities. Another important feature of this framework is that, uh, you know, it provides for interoperability of reporting. That is, if the entities which are already reporting as per an uh, internationally acceptable uh, framework, they just need to do a cross-referencing uh, within our BRSR template. Uh, now, I think, let me turn to what are the expectations from the company boards. So, as I said, company boards are, you know, under increasing pressure from investors and society to be mindful of the organization's environmental and social aspects. And we are seeing examples of this around the world. Just to give you two examples, uh, one incident in 2019 in Australia, the CEO of a large mining company, he was forced to resign following the destruction of heritage sites. Uh, another example from UK, you know, the, the share price of a British fashion brand collapsed when the labor conditions in its supply chain came to light in, in 2020. Uh, so these are, you know, uh, I'm just being brief in the interest of time. So these are some very clear cut examples of why governance matters and how a significant ESG event can actually damage a company's reputation. So again, you know, uh, uh, looking at the legislative side in terms of what are the expectations uh, from, from the company boards. So my understanding is that the broader, and I'm emphasizing the word broader, broader legislative intent uh, in this space in India uh, has been ahead of the curve. Because way back when the new Companies Act 2013 was introduced, uh, it required a director of a company to act in the best interest of the company, its employees, the community, and for the protection of environment. This was this is already enshrined in law. The SEBI LODR equals similar expectations. So what the BRSR does is, is an attempt to elaborate and make this high level legislative resolve more explicit. Uh, you need a framework, you know, just a high level statement doesn't help. So I think the frameworks like BRSR will add to the evolving body of law. So while providing a comprehensive ESG disclosure framework, BRSR also sets out expectations from the company boards. Just to give you some examples. So BRSR seeks disclosures towards Ascertaining the role played and oversight of the company boards on ESG related issues. For example, disclosure is sought of the vision and strategy for managing the significant 
environmental and social impacts of the organization, uh, disclosure of whether sustainability related policies are approved by the board, what is the board level engagement? Uh, are there board committees? If so, what are the details of those board committees which are responsible for decision making on sustainability related issues? What is the frequency of review of performance against sustainability policies by the company boards? So these are just some examples, you know, which are now a part of BRSR. Let me quickly talk about implementation before I before I conclude. So, so BRSR shall be applicable to the top thousand listed companies by market cap on a mandatory basis from 2223. However, entities can choose to adopt it on a voluntary basis from this year itself. And it was music to the ears when you know Ms. Karnat said they are considering adoption this year itself. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm mindful, you know, that quantification is perhaps uh, easier done than the practice, but I would still like to, you know, emphasize, uh, you know, if, if more and more listed companies can take up BRSR uh, during this year itself and not to wait until the next year when it kicks in mandatorily. And I offer two strong reasons. One, to state the obvious, there is increasing evidence which is, you know, sort of proclaiming from the rooftop that higher standards of ESG disclosures and transparencies help in attracting more capital and investment. Secondly, listed companies have an opportunity to lead the trend and inspire their peer group by staying ahead of the curve by becoming the trendsetter. So to reiterate and re-emphasize Earlier adoption of PRSR during this year itself has tremendous potential benefits for listed companies and their stakeholders. Let me, you know, conclude uh, with some, you know, uh, uh, some thoughts here that the ideas of ecological responsibility, reverence for all life, equality, and inclusivity are not new to the Indian ethos. You know, when I mean, we've been told that, uh, uh, you know, you have to treat Earth as mother, uh, you know, in our tradition. Society's expectations from the company boards on sustainability issues, therefore, do not come as a surprise. It is just that these expectations have been rising and gathering a force in recent times. The demand for sustainable reporting that is that valuable information sitting outside the financial statement is also on the rise. BRSR is a step in this direction. It has raised the game in sustainability disclosures. The ball is now in your court. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. You covered all the points. Uh, <laughs> the audience was looking up to and uh, i think the only point which got uh, it needed a little more elaboration was about the social uh, exchange one of our participants uh, had sent a question for you about the status on social exchange i think we are short of time so we will seek your answer separately and uh, we will continue to look forward to your support and guidance sebi has been uh, partnering with the industry in that everything that gets done, the white papers are published, industry participates, and then a decision is taken. I think it's fantastic, and it is giving a heads up to India in the global capital markets on corporate governance. Thank you very much, sir. Now we have with us the chief guest, none other than Mr. Shri Amar Kumarji, chairman of LIC. I would like to invite him. The person, you know, when everybody in the country is talking about Navratnas, talking about uh, Maharatnas, our Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi ji brings out the Kohinoor of India. LIC is indeed the Kohinoor of India. All eyes on the LIC's mega IPO and the man who is going to make it 
a grand success, not only for LIC, but also for the nation. PMO has entrusted him to lead this with his extended tenure at LIC. It's my privilege to invite our chief guest, Shri MR Kumarji, to deliver the inaugural address for IOD's virtual conference on sustainability and imperative with a talk on LIC's digital journey. Digital and sustainability, they go hand in hand. Shri Kumar joined LIC in 1983 as a direct recruit officer, has had a distinguished career of over 38 years at LIC with a unique privilege of heading three zones of LIC, which is South Zone, North Central, and North Zone, headquartered at Chennai, Kanpur, and Delhi. So LIC is quite deep rooted in him and he has also gone quite deep into LIC I must say his rich experience working pan India from bottom to top in different zone and in different streams of insurance management has given him a deep insight into the demographic and country he also chairs the boards of domestic and international subsidiaries of LIC of India mainly LIC housing finance limited LIC mutual funds AMC, LIC Pension Fund Limited, LIC Credit Card Services, IDBI Banks, as well as the overseas JVs of LIC, that is LIC International, BSC, Bahrain, LIC Lanka, LIC Nepal, and LIC Singapore as well. He is also on the board of Ken India Assurance, a life insurance and non-life insurance company in Kenya. May I have the honor of inviting Shri Amar Kumarji, Chairman of LIC of India, who has the Kohinoor of India. Sir, please. Thank you, Mr. Walia. I hope I'm audible. Very much, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Walia. Mr. Shari Shari Bhakti Ji, Mr. Alu Walia, distinguished uh, guests and uh, panelists of the day. Uh, very nice to be in the midst of uh, such distinguished people. I must thank Mr. Shailesh Bhai for uh, inviting me for this. In fact, when he called me up and uh, gave me the subject, I was a little, uh, you know, uh, hesitant because uh, sustainability is not uh, something we talk about every day at the Life Insurance Corporation of India. So uh, I told him, what is it that you want me to do? And he said, why don't you talk about uh, digitization? But then, uh, uh, thanks again, uh, Mr. Shailesh. I have learned so much today already. Uh, listening to uh, Madam Reno, Mr. Mr. Singh of SEBI, and all of you, and given me a lot of insight into what is happening in the sustainability. But of course, I also uh, on the board of ACC, where Mr. Shailesh Bhai is also there, and I listen to him a lot there as well. In fact, Mr. Shailesh talked about three things, and that really struck a chord in me. He spoke about uh, conscious consumption, uh, renewables, and uh, land usage. Uh, very true. Uh, a lot needs to be done. We know what uh, is happening uh, across the globe. It's nice to hear that as a country, we are not way behind. We are ahead of the curve, like some of the speakers said. But I thought, let me share with you uh, something that LIC has done in digitization over the years. Uh, it's a very unique story, which I thought I would share with you which helps us, as you rightly said, technology and digitization is part and parcel of sustainability. Uh, so it's uh, difficult to believe, but then uh, way back in 1960s or 65, to be precise, there were two mainframe systems in the entire Asia, and one of them was the Yogikshama building of LIC. Uh, and it's uh, thanks to our seniors and elders who thought about it then. And uh, perhaps even today, we don't realize that what we started doing in the 60s has led us to what we are today. And today we call it sustainability, but we did not know it then. So we did it for entirely different reasons, as typically because in Mumbai, where uh, it all started, uh, where uh, lots of uh, customers, policyholders, and we were growing even in the 60s and 70s. And we thought that we need to computerize our systems, we need to uh, do something to make things better for customers and things like that. So that is how it all started. But then uh, to give you some brief idea of some milestones that LIC crossed 
in this journey to digitization. In fact, software development started uh, with uh, our EDP department in the 80s. And uh, I, as a young direct recruit, I joined in 1983. I was posted to the EDP department. In fact, I've spent time writing COBOL programs those days. And that is how it all started. We had almost 113 data centers set up uh, for a centralized 2014 branches way back in 2010. And uh, I think we worked very hard to make electronic bills, making online payments a reality quite fast and quite early. In fact, there are two things on sustainability that possibly we have done, as I said, without even knowing it. One is that we have ensured that people can, without traveling, without coming to the offices of LIC, make payments of their premiums. We have also ensured that, I think Mr. Shailesh talked about dematerialization. Basically, we started enterprise document management services in 2006. We have uh, images of 1,300 crores which of all the 29 crore policy holders put together. And let me also share with you that in the first quarter of this year, from April 1st to today, uh, we have had 7.14 crore transactions digitally, collecting 32,000 crores by way of premiums, renewal premiums, et cetera, et cetera. Looking at this journey, I believe that we have uh, possibly done a lot of work in terms of sustainability, in terms of carbon footprint, reducing the emissions and so on and so forth. But then a lot needs to be done listening to Madam Renu and Mr. Singh and uh, listening to all of you gives me a perspective of what maybe we can do in the future. And uh, as LIC also gets listed soon and uh, what Mr. Walia was saying that there is a lot of work happening in the background. And I think we will be able to learn and ad adapt and adopt totally to the new way of doing things. In fact, uh, surprisingly, we had already 12,000 licenses in place for work from home uh, when the pandemic struck us, and it has really helped us to take our operations back office, back home and doing things, working not only from home, working from anywhere. Uh, and that possibly laid the groundwork for us to think about how we can do things differently again in the future as well. I was just uh, looking at some of the things that we've been discussing today. And I also thought to myself that maybe there is a lot more that people who don't realize what is sustainability, people who are you know unconsciously doing things to help in sustainability. Is there something we can do for them? Uh, for example, I was re reading a few days back a story, uh, you know, you get all these uh, clippings in your WhatsApp. So there is this uh, Gondia district where there is something called a network tree. I don't know how many of you have read it. You must have come across it. There are about 150 students who climb up on top of a tree every day with their, you know, mobile phones and earphones for attending a class. Now, why would they do that? Now, the simple reason is this particular village doesn't have network connectivity, not very strong, but it's very strong on top of the tree. So they all climb up on the tree every day instead of walking 18 kilometers to the next village. <coughs> Therefore, these boys, young boys, are actually, you know, giving their bit for sustainability without even knowing it. So if we can create that kind of awareness, the fact that what people are doing and that those of who are not doing it as well, and that I think is very important for us in a country like ours where, you know, education is still not uh, reached the level where people can just by reading a book understand things. There's a lot of work needs to be done in terms of ESG as well as all of us have heard. I, I do not want to, uh, you know, speak uh, beyond this because we have heard quite a bit from the experts. And as I said, I'm learning and uh, LIC as an organization continues to learn. And we will continue to learn in our journey towards the listing as well. I once again thank Mr. Shailesh Bhai for giving me this opportunity. And I'll be reaching out to him to learn more and more on ESG. And thank you, IOD, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so very much, sir. Thank you very much. We
appreciate your time with us. And now I'll request uh, uh, Sri Salishari Bhakti ji to kindly thank Mr. Kumar. Thank you. Formally. Thank you. Yeah. Formally. Yeah. Mr. Kumar, you are such a delight to listen to. Not only on the board of ACC, but here. Yeah. You have created an absolutely new term, unconscious sustainability, deep DNA sustainability. I think that is also what Milind was referring to earlier. And I must say the scintillating conversation that uh, Renuji gave us, gave us a full sweep of how we can position for green finance and how we can make sure that we can as a country get ready to show the world that we can lead in this new field of sustainability. And uh, Mr. Amarjeet Singh from SEBI gave us absolutely stunning clarity on how all of us in corporate India must respond to the BRS, BRSI initiative. But Kumar Saab, we are deeply grateful to you for having uh, given us such a brilliant takeoff for this seminar. And we look forward to interacting with you and we look forward to watching you create and polish the Kohinoor of India and bring it to all of us as a capital market, uh, wonderfully capitalized organization. Our best wishes to you in that wonderful new exercise that you are undertaking. And we look forward to your continued support. Thank you very much. And thank thank you. you, all the people who spoke at this wonderful session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir, for this uh, inaugural session. We are just about 10 minutes behind our schedule. Uh, we'll catch up in the time ahead. So now we have a little video for all of our partners and thank, time to thank them also. We have uh, our principal partners in LIC, in NSDL, e-governance. We also have partners in uh, Birla State. We also have partner to thank in uh, Century Paper and Pulp and also National Stock Exchange. So thank you so much for all our partners in joining us. And Ravi, would you kindly play the video for LIC? Where there is life, there is hope, there is meaning. But life has its downs, as much as its ups. Life is about challenges. Life is about opportunities. Time for joy, time for celebration, and time to introspect. Thankfully, in every one of life's moments, and even beyond life itself, there's LIC. Where there is life, there's always LIC. Zindagi ke saath bhi, zindagi ke baad bhi. Thank you, LIC, and thank you, NSDL. May we have the slide from NSDL? Yes, touching millions of lives through sustainable citizen-centric solutions. That's NSDL e-governance. So we now have the next session coming up uh, on uh, net zero. And uh, roadmap for innovation. So for this, we have with us our panel chair, Mr. Santosh Jairamji, partner and head climate KPMG, a conference on climate change, sustainability, CSR is incomplete without Santosh Ji's nuggets of experiences, experience sharing in this domain. He brings huge stories and experiences to share. Mr. Santosh Jairaman, partner KPMG, leads one of the biggest sustainability consulting teams in Asia for KPMG. He has contributed 
across 20 country, teams, countries and multi-sectors in the space of sustainability and climate change. He is an advisory council member of KPMG Impact, which is a global initiative of KPMG to bring together different streams of work with an objective to create higher impact on society. He's also a fellow of Institute of Directors. So very happy for him for accepting our fellowship. Santosh Jaraman specializes in areas of extra financial risk assessment, responsible business, corporate sustainability, product sustainability, sustainability reporting and climate change, a B tech from Calicut University. He did his master's in environmental science and engineering from IIT Mumbai. In 2010, he completed a course covering sustainable technologies from University of California, Berkeley campus. He's most sought after for his expertise in developing standards in sustainability space. He has contributed as a member of technical committee for the development of the international stakeholders engagement standards and also as member of GRI G4 working group on application level. Some of his work with his clients are so good that it finds place as case studies for institutes like Harvard and NCI. The speaker much in demand. He also contributes regularly to national and international media. He is generous in sharing knowledge and he has been a guest faculty at leading educational institutes. My personal favorite with him is about social exchange where Sebi has invited him to be uh, submitting a consultative paper. Santoshji's work in social exchange is going to transform the face of business and to bring social for profit into a reality soon. Over to Santoshji for this. He has got his three uh, panelists, which includes uh, Gauri Johar, she is executive director at IHS Market. She is highly applauded and recognized in energy transition and clean tech consulting IHS Market and thus becomes the first choice speaker at sustainability conclaves all over the world. As executive director of IHS Market, she brings 23 years of experience and real life stories in energy transition, clean tech consulting, including energy systems thinking and problem solving with energy stakeholders using the tools of applied economics and finance with wide range of regional experiences in UK, US, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, Mumbai, New Delhi, and companies like British Petroleum, IHS Market, National Council for Applied Economic Research, with focus on sustainability, finance, multi-sectoral strategies for clean air, corporate benchmarking on ESG energy, and above all, she is also a master class alumni of IOD. So we are so very happy and proud of her. Next, we have with her to give company is Mr. Sanjay Khare, who also happens to be an IOD master class uh, alumni and a certified corporate director from IOD. Mr. Sanjay Khare is a board member and vice president at sustainability at uh, Skoda Auto Volkswagen Private Limited, where he's the chief sustainability catalyst and leads sustainability initiatives at the company in India and also for the brands Audi, Porsche, Lamborghini. Surely it is height of luxury, and you rarely find luxury sitting on the lap of sustainability. Sanjay has a tough task, a BTEC from IIT Kanpur, executive MBA from MDI. And he's not only certified corporate director from IOD, but also qualified independent director from IACA. Most of his career has been with major Japanese and European automotive OEMs in Indian subcontinent for over 35 years. Across diversified functions like manufacturing, HR, quality, safety, and sustainability. He leads an active climate resilience program where the automotive major in India is already achieving 
zero waste to landfill, water positive, zero liquid discharge certification, zero accidents, targeting an 18.5 megawatt of installed rooftop solar plant at a single automotive site in 2021. And it is going to be fully carbon neutral production by 2025, huge achievement. He takes active interest in uh, cultural changes, competency building, HR motivation topics. He's a very sought after speaker and uh, on automotive and sustainability topics on national and international forums. In his personal life, he's an endurance cyclist, having participated in many multi-century uh, adventure club ride expeditions. And when he's at leisure, he plays the classical music instrument called sitar. He has mastered it. I wish we had some time and he would have brought his sitar for us to listen to some sitar from him. Third speaker and panelist is Anir Ban Chatterjee, business head of supply chain practice at DNV. Anir Ban Chatterjee is a digital uh, innovation, sustainable finance, management consulting, and risk management professional with about uh, a dozen years of diverse experience into TIC industry, financial services. He's a technology enthusiast, certified specialist on blockchain, AI, ML, and qualified assessor in sustainable finance, climate risk, ESG, QHSE, sustainable water management. He has led India's first GRI G4 report assurance for a cement producer in 2014, as early as then, and was a certified GRI trainer and assessor also. He also has expertise in climate finance, CSR monitoring and governance, SRI and management systems and audit, uh, you name a thing in this domain. And he has uh, contributed uh, in more than one way. He's looking after the territory of not only India, but also Middle East for DNV. And uh, so Santosh has a very, very good panel with him. And I would request him to chair and uh, share the storytelling, sharing, and discussion, and take some Q&As as well. Please, Santosh ji, kindly. All thank yours. You. Thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you for that uh, very, very uh, uh, elaborate kind of introduction and uh, it's always a pressure to be in the forum of IOD and uh, what are you hiding about social uh, exchange role that you are playing no 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 <laughs> uh, I think uh, Sabi Amarjit Singh uh, was there already I mean he was the chair of the committee yeah. so I, I played only a small role of one of sir, the members sir. of the committee so I think uh, uh, you know I think he he should be the person who should be speaking but anyway, uh, you know, net zero and climate change, I think, isn't this the holy grail inside the ESG, right? When we talk about the whole of ESG sustainability, I think um, the, the one of the most uh, um, uh, important kind of topic in today's is climate change. And um, maybe, uh, you know, before I go to the panelists, maybe I can give a bit of a context and let me start from a uh, dialogue or a conversation which I read from uh, one of the novels uh, written in 1926. Uh, this is uh, a novel by the name The Sun Also Rises uh, by none other than Ernst Hemingway. So the character there, Mike Campbell, is asked about his money troubles and uh, he responds in a manner that is a bit of a self-contradiction. So the dialogue goes like this. The, the character Bill is asking to Mike saying, how did you go bankrupt? The question is, how did you go bankrupt? And Mike says, two ways, gradually and then suddenly. <laughs> now, when it comes to climate change, I think this is the best uh, uh, conversation which I can quote. And uh, today this, uh, you know, it was gradual. But I think it has really picked up pace and we are already seeing the risk starting to precipitate. So we already have the first bankruptcy and due to climate change. It has already happened. 
we are seeing drastic strategy shifts in various industry segments and i'm quite sure many of you would be hearing oil to chemical now that sounds quite uh, uh, you know familiar now uh, almost everybody is speaking about oil to chemical shift coal to solar and then fossil fuel to electric so i think it's it's kind of big shift which is happening in this dimension so i think uh, thanks to iod you have put together a kind of a very good panel to discuss this new buzzword of net zero and uh, gauri who works in the space of energy transition and clean tech uh, will definitely touch upon the role um, you know the, the manner in which energy is playing a big role on net zero uh, sanjay ji would cover the volkswagen's plans as to how they are going to achieve towards the zero and uh, anirban would educate us on some of the key standards that the organization can follow in the journey towards the net zero but as a context setting let me explain um, why net zero and what is this net zero okay so the science tells us that man made carbon dioxide emissions need to fall by about 45% by 2030 compared to 2010 levels and reach net zero by mid century which is 2050 to give the world a good chance of limiting our warming to 1.5 degree now the question can uh, people can ask is why 1.5 degree because you know it was under the paris agreement that nearly 200 companies uh, sorry no 200 countries uh, said that they would limit the rise in global temperature to well below 2 degree centigrade and strive to keep it to a ceiling of 1.5 degree so that's where the limit comes in my host of the event sorry yeah so by 2050 we should be balancing the ghg emissions which we produce and you know it should be balanced with the mr balan is there can i ask the organizers to mute the others okay thanks um so you know there should be this balance between the emissions produced and the emissions removed from atmosphere this is what we call as the net zero i just completed reading a, a a fiction book which is called the ministry for the future written by kim stanley robinson the book's plot starts with uh, it's set in the future and it starts in up uh, and up being hit by a big heat wave that's how the whole book starts and the plot runs through the impact of climate change the difficulties this a particular body set by the un has been implementing the paris agreement and how it also goes through a lot of climate induced violences and all those kind of things so i think it's it's kind of a little terrifying future which we look into when we see from a climate change perspective the pandemic uh, showed us how a global level impact would look like and uh, that was also the tipping point for people to realize the importance of uh, climate change because covid at least have a hope in terms of vaccines but climate change definitely doesn't have vaccines as well and i think that's one of the reason why we see a big push in terms of uh, uh, capital allocation or big capital allocation towards climate change and i think some of the earlier speakers did mention and the eu sustainable finance taxonomy is clearly looking into climate change in a big manner so why is it important to uh, india inc i think we have crossed about 30 indian companies who have committed to net zero we have a couple who have already reached that level of neutrality so what exactly is the driver for these companies one definitely is uh, you know uh, the 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 finance part of it the market valuations the investment risk uh, cost of capital um, all these things would be in the top but the second driver i would say is the future fit organization because in terms of there is only one journey like one northward journey which is a low carbon future now in going into the low carbon future how future fit you are as an organization in terms of your own processes your own products and all those things and i think the other one is the customers net zero commitments because we are in the value chain of uh, many of the global customers 
and then last but not the least is also the huge business opportunity arising from the uh, uh, this particular journey towards uh, net zero and since uh, lic was there uh, uh, you know in the call i was just saying is that for example climate change could put the insurance out of reach for many people because the kind of impact which is going to cause it's already being talked about as to how the 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 rates would go up so this transition which is characterized by net zero is beginning to reverberate uh, both upstream and downstream of the business and uh, does people have a kind of a clear uh, uh, pathway to reach this net zero i would say you know every bit of the nuts and bolts will not be very clear as of now but broadly if you look at the three dimensions reduce emission from operation adopt clean energy sources and offset the remaining emission i think that's broadly the pathway to the net zero is going to be reducing emission is mostly efficiency improvement right i mean you improve your process efficiency or optimize your logistics you are reducing emissions clean energy is today cheaper but there will still be emissions which will be required to be offset. So all these three components would be very clear. So I think I will stop there since we have a great panel and I will kind of uh, now request Gauri. Energy is the key component uh, towards the net zero. So maybe Gauri over to you uh, to, uh, you know, and I will request all my panelists to stick to their timeline of about six or seven minutes. Over to you Gauri. Thank you so much, Santosh, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Vikeshji, to have me here uh, to invite me to this panel. Uh, really delighted and honored to really be here with uh, amongst this galaxy of uh, experts. Um, and it was uh, fantastic to listen to the you know the scene setting that was done uh, by the inaugural session. Uh, all the uh, experts of of industry, of the financial industry, uh, and uh, Mr. Shailesh Haribakti Ji also. So thank you so much. It's a real honor. And um, I will, uh, you know, keep some few slides as a background. Uh, I'll refer to them a little later, but I will just keep them up and um, uh, just so that um, it's always nice to have something to take away uh, is what I really believe in. So just give me one minute if I can just put that up. Okay. It's just loading up. Uh, you know how I shift these slides? I'm sorry, I, I'm I'm new to this. Uh, uh, okay, let me just go to the next one. And with the help of a down arrow, you can okay, shift. There we the go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So, um, you know, when I thought about sustainability, I, I think the what came to mind was uh, to be or not to be. That is the question, and I think. We've uh, explored this question in so many ways, but sustainability is all about that. It's about the planetary to be or not to be. Um, and and I, I really like Santosh's uh, reference uh, to, um, you know, Ernest Hemingway that it first happens gradually, then suddenly. And, and I think that's what we are really uh, trying to avoid here. Um, so without any further ado, um, in the language of design and systems design, uh, you know, we are confronted really with a wicked problem of sustainability with a capital S. Um, in the 1970s, there were two design theorists, Rittel and Weber, who characterized problems such as sustainability as wicked because they're difficult to solve, they have trying timelines, and they have a challenge of coordinated action. And what's interesting is that the problem solvers and the problem creators are often on the same side of the equation, energy companies in this case. And the tendency to prioritize exists uh, that we pr prioritize the present over the future, which is also called uh, hyperbolic discounting. Hence, the path out of addressing the effects of climate change, as has been laid out by my former speakers and experts, appears to be nonlinear, uncertain, and material. And energy and economic choices may very well collide with climate constraints. Since the late 1980s, with the setting up of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and then the Kyoto Protocol of the early 90s, sustainability has been coming into a sharper focus. The very existence of our species, to be or not to be, in the evergreen words of the Great Bard, have acquired dimensions of greater breadth and greater depth. 
In the mid 2000s, as the impact of the US shale gas revolution was gaining strength in the energy world, and it took a lot of uh, energy experts also by surprise, the focus on sustainability was also growing sharper. Uh, just about then, there were three things um, on a personal note that left a mark on me as a as an energy professional um, as I was making a shift uh, from uh, an energy career largely focused on North America to Southeast Asia. It was in those mid 2000s also uh, when um, BP launched the carbon footprint calculator for the very first time. Um, the, the book Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth was launched for the very first time. And um, I happened to meet a young climate specialist uh, uh, in uh, Germany, and, and that really began to make me think about sustainability beyond the sustainability of an energy company's financial strategy in the midst of booms and busts of commodity and economic cycles. Um, the, la the latter was really where the bulk of my training and experience resided, so sustainability in some senses was new. Um, I now knew that there was something more that had to be factored in. The word sustainability had acquired a meaning much greater than jargon, and one that needed the swift attention of companies and countries. Roll forward, climate change with each passing decade has gained the attention of a wider spectrum of stakeholders in a bid to prevent a market failure in addressing its challenge to sustainability. As Santosh also mentioned, the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015 was a watershed event, which has increased the pressure for climate related financial risk disclosures, I think some of which were also referred to um, in Mrs. Uh, uh, Karnad's speech and Mr. Amarjeet Singh's speech. Post Paris, the task force on climate disclosures established by the Financial Stability Board has 31 members from across the G20 and has been adopted by more than 1500 organizations with a total market cap of $12.6 trillion and financial institutions responsible for assets of $150 trillion. Firmly rooted in the complexities of this interrelated energy and economic system, sustainability last year, the year of 2020 COVID reached the boiling point of net zero ambitions by countries and companies. More than 100 countries accounting for over 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions have now announced net zero targets. Energy companies are increasingly announcing a range of net zero targets on the nature of emission reductions they are going to focus on. So those nature of reductions are sometimes scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, depending on whether it is direct or indirect <laughs> energy use that impacts those emissions. And they're under increasing pressure from investors to demonstrate that 1.5 to the path of reduction in emissions. In the quest of this, for this planetary balance, central to net zero ambitions. India and India Inc. are no exceptions, though we face the classic dilemma of de development and its associated carbon footprint that are foundational to our energy mix and choices. In this, India Inc. has, as shown by the 2035 net zero ambition of Reliance Industries and about 29 other companies and energy compacts of even companies like NTPC, Toyota Kirloskar, JK Cement, Ultratech are noteworthy. Uh, while India Inc. can accelerate on this net zero path by the right portfolio choices of, of as um, you know, Santosh laid it out very well about uh, clean energy choices, offsets and reduction in emissions, India as a country will likely have to show a more considered path to adopt net zero or a variation of net zero that really incorporates this balance of climate ambition and climate justice. As this dichotomy of the path to net zero and the Indian economy play out, um, I would like to share uh, about five points for the consideration for the boardroom and the policymaker alike. And this is where I will go to the next slide, uh, wherein um, in IHS market, uh, you know, we, we view the world in different scenarios, different worldviews. So if we take a very base case path to net zero for India, India, what we see still remains largely reliant on fossil fuels to meet its energy needs. Um, it, it, uh, right now, India is about 76% reliant on fossil fuels. That will come down to 68%, but still way above 50%. The share of renewables, of course, will increase by the end of 2050, but still save below 15%. However, if we really commit to it very strongly, um, to that 1.5 aligned path, 
which is much more ambitious and aggressive. In the green rules scenario, what we call it the green rules scenario, the share of fossil fuels can decline to as much as 37% by 2050. But that will require a lot of commitment, a lot of coordinated action on the part sorry. of the uh, Sorry. Okay. Sorry, uh, you have you moved your slides? Yeah, we we. Got yeah, I, I I just moved it. So that will require a much larger uh, committed action on the part of India and India Inc. acting in sync. Um, in terms of the other um, aspects to this, uh, you know, these sort of five points, the road to net planetary net zero. So if the world has to achieve net zero targets. That road to planetary net zero goes through India and China. For the global energy system to achieve net zero by the mid-century, India and China are key due to the size of the population, high economic growth rates, and associated development goals. In the period through 2050, from now to 2050, China's share of key industrial sectors in global industrial production that account for emissions growth will go from 39% to 59, 51%, and India's will fall short of uh, to about 10% from about 4% right now. Under the most likely base case view of India, we see emissions will grow on average 2% a year from now until 2050. So how to fix that? Um, the, I, I really believe that the equations for carbon price, cost of growth, and value of clean air will need to be aligned. For the Indian economy, this will require putting a value on clean air by enacting a sufficient carbon price mechanism that can alter fuel choices and remove the high carbon lock-in uh, of this Indian energy mix. There was a coal cess mechanism, there has been a coal cess mechanism, which is, well, you can call it a de facto carbon price. It has not been sufficient to alter the use of coal and incentivize cleaner fuels. For India Inc.'s boardroom, this will imply carbon pricing entering project stage gates of approval and decision making. We have seen automotive companies like the Mahindras announce that very explicitly, and this needs to be as important and, and visible as the interest rate for debt or the oil price for energy consumption assumptions in planning assumptions for com company boards. Technologically, uh, the fifth point, India has a huge opportunity right now to leapfrog in the next generation of material high impact low carbon technologies like hydrogen and carbon capture utilization and storage. As a world leader in refining and petrochemical capacity, India Inc. can actually accelerate the hydrogen economy across the value chain. In carbon capture, we have case studies of innovation by companies with local engineering talent, such as Carbon Clean, that are deploying techno technology both globally and in India. India's talent advantage of world-class engineers can meet the needs for accelerating and innovating on low carbon technologies. India also happens to be the largest global location of global carbon offsets, which, which creates a huge, uh, I would almost call it a bargaining chip in this climate negotiation space. Ultimately, um, and this is where I'll come to my last slide here, um, it is not going to be easy. And it requires a systems thinking approach um, at the global level. What you're seeing here are um, signs of, you know, a, a recognition at the consumer level. I think in the opening, um, uh, Mr. Hari Bhakti very clearly said that consumers will have to change. And I think consumers, that reality has caught up with consumers because consumers also are the job seekers and they realize that there are no jobs on a, on a dead planet at its worst. So ultimately, um, my closing uh, point would be that an energy systems approach would need would have to be adopted by the Indian economy, where several global, national, subnational points of influence and leverage of carbon pricing, energy choices, economic choices, cost of capital, will really run like a large non-linear programming problem where the clear and present impacts of climate change and local air quality will manifest in more ways than one. Peter Singhi, key pro proponent of systems thinking and uh, also the author of the book, uh, The Fifth Discipline shares that the world is made up of circles and we think in straight lines. We need to adopt that circular systemic approach to sustainability, both in the boardroom and in policy making. Thank you. Thank you, Gauri. And I think, uh, yeah, a, a good thinking um, 
topic to the boards at the end and um, thank you for that uh, sanjay maybe i would ask you to kind of uh, brief in terms of how as an org company you are planning towards uh, your journey towards the net zero while you are uh, preparing um, you know to put out your slides let me also share that about a decade back one of the automotive uh, organizations in the country we did uh, a kind of a work and the first year we kind of measured the carbon footprint. The very next year, they were 20% down. When I asked them, they said, yeah, we outsourced some operations. So definitely would like to hear more uh, from Volkswagen. Hello? So I've not unmuted myself. So uh, okay. Yes, okay. Yeah. So I am unmuted now. So I'll share. Try. I'm trying to share my screen right now. Uh, but in the meantime, I really thank uh, this entire panel over here for the wonderful insights we are bringing in. Thank you, VKSG, for the really, I mean, blessed uh, introduction that you gave to me and alumni of IOD. And thank you, Shalish Haribaktiji, for chairing this conference and bringing all the beautiful insights. So, Shalish Haribakti Sahab, you said that we should start using electric vehicles. The very first thing is that we are going to launch the Audi e-tron in this current month is a wonderful luxury vehicle in the pure electric segment. We are also launching Porsche Taycan, which is already there. These are two things. That's the way we are coming to India through the uh, luxury vehicle segment. In Europe, our EVs are becoming very, very popular. I mean, the sale of uh, Volkswagen Group vehicles is more than twice the Tesla vehicles right now. Yes, future is going to be electric and future is going to be bi-directional. We'll talk about the word bi-directional in the times. So I'm just trying to, uh, yes, so now my slide is visible. So yes, can you see my slide now? Yes, so I will make it full screen. Yes, so. Uh, uh, So uh, are you able to see it full screen or it's still? Yes, the... we, can, we can see full screen. Go right. Ahead. So we are in India taking care of these five brands, Skoda, Volkswagen, Audi, Lamborghini, and Porsche. And what you see in front has come as a group, a maturity analysis, the decarbonization was a top focus area, Greek carbonization, circular economy, resources, uh, responsibility in supply chain, business are the four focus areas which, have, which are a part of the entire uh, um, entire uh, sustainability focus areas and that's how we are moving right now and we have seen that transport has 14 percent of emissions of the entire global emissions and volkswagen as a group has got a one percent share we have a responsibility towards that so what are we doing for that so we have to become a co2 neutral society that is what the paris climate agreement all about but we are driving co2 neutral mobility and to all of us 600 000 employees worldwide we are working on individual CO2 neutral footprint. It's a very, very focused campaign that's been going on with all of our employees also. So, um, so here you can see what we have done is to uh, align. Uh, are you able to see my screens or not? Changing the screens? No, I'm I, at least I'm not. Uh, the the slide doesn't. Slide change, change is not happening. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. So there is some issue. There are wonderful slides over here, but. Why the technology is not really. So I would request if you can please uh, change the slides with the laptop yeah. or desktop panel. No, no, yeah, no. It's not changing. Change. Yes, it's yeah, not yeah. changing. Sorry, sorry. So I have just pushed, pushed forward decarbonization of the main focus area I talked about. I talked about these four focus areas. I talked about 1% as a major, I mean, uh, uh, major of uh, our emissions that we are there out of the 14 percent transport emission emissions we are talking about co2 neutral mobility how do we do it by 2050 we have to be carbon neutral we have announced a very clear program of uh, aligning to co2 as science-based targets to uh, by 2030 in, uh, in the reduction plan and by 2050 we have to become carbon neutral this is a very clear plan and this has been uh, announced by dr d's our global chairman and we have a very, very ambitious go to zero program focused on four areas, climate change, resources, air quality and environmental compliance. Climate change is all about uh, implementing uh, total neutrality and bring out the overall uh, life cycle emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. 
resources about the five factors of CO2, energy, waste, VOC, and water. And environmental compliance is into each and every aspect of the compliance systems with a lot of integrity that we are trying to drive. Not drawing, it has been driven now very well across all the brands. And now this is the main slide, and this is where Santosh, you can see the on the side what you have precisely said that effective and sustainability CO2 avoidance, second is about switch to renewable energy, and third is about the compensation. Precisely, you have talked about our global strategy already. I think you are a soothsayer. <laughs> but uh, uh, we have got the five areas of our entire value chain that is uh, from resource extraction to supply chain to in house uh, production that we do. Then comes the use phase that is a fuel supply and tailpipe emissions and then the end of life. Now, for all these five stages, we started it focusing in India on the uh, uh, that is the production phase and the supply chain right now. Uh, from you uh, from Europe, we are working in a very, very focused way on the fuel supply and tailpipe emissions. We'll talk more in the next slides. In India, we have got these four, six specific areas we are working upon. Decarbonization, zero waste, circular economy, water conservation, social solubility, biodiversity, and compliance. Uh, so we have set up already India's largest solar rooftop, which is saving us 9,000 tons or 9,020 tons of CO2 every year. This is already 8.5 megawatts. I'm adding another 10 megawatts this year. Now, biggest thing is that what was said that climate change has already come to a tipping point. Yes. This cost is so cheap by installing this plant, which has been done totally on an OPEX basis. We have not invested the money. What power I was buying for 8 rupees 20 paisa a unit, now I'm getting it for 3 rupees 20 paisa a unit. All simply because I have just uh, given off my rooftops for uh, putting the solar plants, which were otherwise idle. So this is the sustainability means good business. This is what I'm driving in my organization also. That sustainability is also good for economics. And that's what has been very, very uh, well accepted. You can see all my board members from um, Czech Republic here for the inauguration of the first green car made by the green energy. And they, we have got a very aggressive plan. By next year, we'll be putting up a biogas plant also, seven and a half tons by the local uh, food waste. And we have got a very clear roadmap to become totally carbon neutral in production by 2025. We mean it. Uh, we already have become a zero waste to landfill plants, both the plants. Uh, uh, Pune plant is just less than 1% left for the final landfill closer and that's everything has been well we have got very strong production unit with paint shops and all but wonderfully we have done we made able to do the circular economy based system a lot of our wastes are going for circular economy things so for generating carbon black or generating uh, uh, primers and thinners from the waste so a lot of things are happening there are people I mean we have a very strong system of internal communication on a monthly basis and so much motivation is there in the entire team they come with wonderful ideas to implement circular economy and things like this we have also become water positive so whatever amount of water we use inside our plant more than three times of that we sequester outside so the, and we are also zero liquid discharge plant already already for the last two years we are certified zero liquid discharge plant so this is towards our social responsibility and all this, whatever positives we are doing has left a very, very positive impact on the biodiversity. These are the photographs of our own campus. These are our own internal eco park or a, or a biodiversity park we have. And uh, uh, in the last census, 250, 2015, we did from the, the Pune University. We had the 240 species and the one that we have done this year, we've got 320 species, including the very, very wild eagle, owl, and uh, number of butterflies, even the Indian fox is there inside our campus. And all with, we have been launching wonderful cars. We have taken out Kushak uh, SUV and Taigun SUV, wonderful 1 billion euro we have invested into in India. And still we have, we are doing such a responsible way that the biodiversity is thriving. And we took out a, a coffee table book on this topic on uh, Body Environment Day, where it was very, very highly appreciated in the uh, groups. I can share with you a copy of all this. We have already invested on, around 450,000 mangrove plantations. This is towards our uh, what you call uh, carbon neutralization program that we are doing it though is a part of CSR we are not claiming it as a neutralization but we are investing heavily into mangrove forestation with the Maharashtra government on the Konkan coast we are also now working knowing very well that India uh, this uh, we do have a India and South Africa these are two areas uh, in the group which we feel has got very strong solar uh, potential and in India we are working with now with our suppliers on a pallet basis to really motivate them and there will be 10 of them will be from the German or Czech European origin and 10 will be from India. We'll work with them hand in hand, really 
bring them out and make, make them on a level on which they can come at par to what we are operating on. This will also meet many SD sustainable development goals. Same thing, we are now going to over dealerships, all the five brands, all the dealerships. We know that customer is a touch point and that's where we can speak best, best about, about our sustainability initiatives, what we are driving. And circular economy and life cycle engineering, here you can see Audi Q5, we did the life cycle engineering, we reduced the weight by 50 kgs and emissions by 6%, uh, the entire life cycle emissions of the car, as well as about the fuel efficiency also was improved. So the, all these thought processes are very much there into the company, into the entire process. And this is one of the final slides. In European Union, we on this 20th of April, we installed this way to zero program. Here you can see that uh, what really I talked about, this is the first uh, top line, but in the middle, you can see that the wonderful thing they are talking about future is bi-directional. They, they are going to make all the electric vehicles as a mobile storage device. So, and each and every home, each and every office is going to be there with uh, solar or wind or such renewable grid connection with obviously with mobile app. And it's not, I'm talking of a long-term future. The future is real over here right now. LD is a company who's working along with us. Uh, then the entire green network of the uh, renewable power over there, these cars are connected. So whenever you are uh, not using the car, which is car is unused 95% of the time, it's getting charged. It's there on the grid. Time it needs power, it charges itself. Otherwise, it feeds back the power back to the grid. <coughs> Last thing they are talking about is the future for urban mobility. Instead of talking the mobility topic is all about how do we really think about approaching cities? I mean, how do we make a network like what we, we have in places like Amsterdam? A very good network of road, rails, and water transport, as well as metros. So that is more talking of approachability versus mobility. It has to be really connected together. So in the end, we have to really minimize the environmental burden by zero CO2 emission plants. And then holistic decarbonization program derived from the Paris Climate Agreement. Consistent switch to renewable energy across the value chain. Compliance, integrity, and governance and management conduct very, very important for us and leaving positive impact on the load, water local environment, water land diversity and society at large, aligning to UN Sustainable Development Goals. So I have talked about basic gas tax over here and there's nothing that I've talked about which is any theory, but yes, this is what we have been practicing and really we are working with heart on the topic. So thank you so much. I thought, I thought, uh, I think I would have taken take care of the time part too. No, thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. I think, um, um, you know, many times when we talk a lot of theory, I think it is good to kind of showcase what can be achieved by an organization and you very clearly brought it out. And I think uh, the, the topic uh, uh, also is something as we go along, there need to be universal comparabilities, there need to be, you know, uh, a, a kind of a standards, uh, what need to be followed and all those things. So, Anirban, I think we are already delayed by almost about 20 minutes right now. I think uh, we would uh, uh, ask you also to be brief uh, and uh, to uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, LH Arivar Piji. Thank you, Mr. Vikesh Arviyaj also for inviting uh, to share our perspective. At the same time, it's been an absolute uh, great learning for last one and a half hours to uh, you know, uh, listen to all the industry dollars and uh, these panelists extremely, you know, touching upon the facts of action where all we need to, you know, do. So uh, I would uh, touch upon one uh, very important aspect of uh, uh, the net zero ambitions of India Inc., uh, you know, which uh, what the organizations need to follow in terms of the standardization, uh, the assurance approach or from a practical point of view, how they can actually ingrain or integrate uh, uh, decarbonization or near zero ambition into their management system DNA. So I have only a couple of slides and I want to just share uh, with all of you. Let me just put the slide. Just give me a moment. Yeah, kindly keep it to minimum. Are you able to see my screen? Uh, I... Okay. Uh, so uh, on the industry vision, we are hearing uh, aligning with the national vision and road to net zero. Of course, Indian government is uh, yet to come out with a strong climate change kind of a bill, which is expected uh, in some time. But uh, uh, it is imperative that, you know, the approach should be aligned and consistent for all the heavy emitters. 
So uh, what we think that probably a uh, three pronged approach to strengthen the strength decarbonization vision because many of the corporates or uh, intergovernment panel or even the states or the local uh, municipalities, they are also looking at contributing towards the net zero. So what should be the consistent uh, platform or an approach uh, organization should take to meet India's NDC? Of course, that is the first imperative for all of us to uh, achieve the 2030 goal. And then, uh, uh, you know, uh, to reduce our overall emission of 2033 to 35% from 2005 level. And in a process, the heavy emitter, the process industries, the energy and the steels have to contribute more. Uh, in this uh, aspect, I think that, you know, the uh, three-pronged approach, which I'm talking about, the connection, the capability and the credibility will play an important role in and will be, a, uh, you know, uh, in the journey or the pathway, uh, good uh, uh, you know uh, support for all the uh, corporates. So we see that a lot of corporates are seeing uh, taking a lot of uh, corporate level strategy or the group level strategy. Sometimes it is uh, aligned with their global vision, but when it comes to uh, the granular imp implementation at the business unit level or the site level, it sometimes lags and that delays the entire achievement uh, timeline. So. Uh, the connectivity with respect to the uh, global vision or a uh, uh, you know uh, corporate level strategy that has to match with the implementation uh, action or the uh, timeline. So that is what the connection plays an important role. And as we are all learning and the evolving uh, you know segment of uh, capacity building, it is uh, very important that uh, uh, all the corporates also identify various decarbonization champions and you know try to. There are various uh, ideas which uh, Mr. Khare also talked about. Those are uh, the internal benchmarking tools need to be developed in order to ensure that the overall capacity for the organization is aligned with the goal of the organization for the net zero. And this awareness creation internally to externally, and these all would add to the overall climate resilience uh, for the corporates in the short term, medium term, and long term. And of course, uh, the credibility is very important. We do not want uh, net zero uh, targets or commitment uh, to be, uh, or, you know, many or most corporates might take it as a greenwash or consumer driven world. It should not happen in the product stewardship also. The robust measurement, monitoring framework, and the scenario planning with various standards and guidelines are very important. So uh, there comes the importance of set up of very important uh, the internal assurance practices uh, and also supported by external assurance so so that the baseline uh, from the baseline the reduction then the offset and then meeting whatever is the uh, remaining part of the uh, carbon reduction everyone can achieve together in an aligned manner in a sustained manner so uh, what we i have six steps to share across to the audience and to the panelists for your views that uh, we all have seen and come across to the standards for last 20, 25 years in the star birth of ISOs. Uh, and we have seen that uh, many a times organizations, uh, processes and procedures are very much aligned with this key plan, do check and act and the basic uh, quality management principles. But I am uh, you know, pitching here and focusing that let us all try to adopt a similar approach to make sure that the net zero strategy is also ingrained into the management system DNA and we can you know look forward to, to adopt some of the global standards and framework. So at the beginning as uh, Gauri has also talked about that the baseline and uh, you know what is the vision, what is the timeline, how uh, the organizations should look for, what are the key pillars of the net zero strategy that need to be brought in and then uh, of course there are global best practices of uh, the sectoral best practices which can be looked at from a baseline uh, defining point of view, uh, you know, uh, the organization may choose a national baseline or the organization may uh, choose a, their own baseline. But uh, the greenhouse gas inventory, that should be a kind of a basic, uh, uh, you know, standards and methodologies, which uh, helps to benchmark that what should be my short term, medium term and long term goal. And there are ISO 14,064 series of standards, the WRI, GAG protocol, which has helped us, all of us but now probably we need to look at the entire uh, net zero in an integrated vision so that you know on not only we limit ourselves into the annual disclosure of our emission but also you know align it with what is our 
uh, achievement with respect to uh, the um, emission mitigation and adaptation strategy. So, uh, engage in this point, the third step, which is the engagement with the key stakeholders plays an important role, not only within the organization and the global peer, but also the external stakeholders like government, regulators, and also investors in a large way. So, uh, development of this implementation and communication engagement plan will certainly play an important role that how much you require to calibrate yourself. This is your own sectoral, uh, you know, uh, aspect of net zero. And, you know, whether it is really uh, adding value to the national net zero target, uh, that is, we have to see. And, you know, we need to keep on calibrating. And I feel that the net zero going forward for all corporates should be very much dynamic. But the targets, you know, uh, many a times due to the current uh, situation, global pandemic, the initiatives are also not being aligned and, uh, you know, you need, you are not able to achieve what the way uh, at the pace you want. So that's why this uh, alignment of the what all uh, stakeholder vision also is important. And we have all seen, uh, we have heard the Sevi chairman also uh, uh, talked about the BRSR. I think that is going to be an excellent tool for corporates to going forward to align with uh, overall global benchmarking as well as stakeholder engagement as a view. Then uh, uh, it's very important that we think of the scenarios. Uh, you know, Gauri has really uh, touched upon how uh, the scenario planning should be done. But uh, we have seen currently, except few sectors, the scenario planning and uh, you know activities have not started because probably uh, we do not have enough or adequate tool sector specific or uh, you know we do not uh, know that how the guideline will uh, impact our own uh, business strategy so the the tcfd guidelines we have seen many of the corporates in india have also started adopting the tcfd guideline for uh, disclosure but then it is very much important to set up the climate governance at the very beginning at the top level of the board uh, so that you know we are seeing some of the corporates are coming out with psg committees of the board they are redefining the sustainability and strengthening the existing CSR committee. So I think this will uh, be the new norm uh, going forward. And uh, uh, there has to be mandate from the board to see how the business is going to perform in different climate scenarios. And I think some of the global standards will certainly play an important role. Uh, coming to reduction option, we have seen the you know energy transition the, uh, as a very important uh, activity, but then there is a whole of or the library of decarbonization option which organization can take but uh, in terms of standard there are two emerging standard i would like to draw attention to all the uh, audience out there that there is an iso 14080 standard which is basically which has not adopted globally as of now very well but iso has come out with a very good standard to make it uh, integrated with the management system it's called uh, climate action for mitigation and adaptation so whatever reduction initiative you are taking, whether it is actually going to sustain or it is one of an action. So that will define to ISO 14080. And then there is a new standard which has come for ISO 14097, uh, which is actually greenhouse gas management and how the financing activities actually, uh, uh, you know, would play an important role in terms of bridging the, uh, you know, net zero gap in terms of clean technology, in terms of reduction, uh, technology transfer as well as carbon capture storage and large scale, uh, you know, sync development. So, uh, 14097 is a very important standard. I think these two standards will take over slowly uh, in years to come. And I would encourage all uh, the you know audience also to look at this standard, identify what are the opportunities for you. And then we have, uh, you know, many of our corporate partners here uh, in India as well as uh, globally we have seen carbon neutral organizations, how they are doing it, and PASS 2060 is a very important standard, which not only talking about your baseline, but also talking about your overall gap assessment and, you know, neutrality strategy and offset uh, and, uh, you know, carbon credit as well. So uh, the portfolio of the overall offset project and how the investment and implementation plan goes hand in hand, that will also play an important role and with measurement and analytics. So, what I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, request and view, you know, ask view from all the panelists also here that how we, from the step one to step thing, we can align and try to see an integrated action for corporates to achieve the net zero strategy 
and uh, uh, we can uh, uh, you know make the overall climate governance more robust more action oriented and more uh, you know measurement oriented and assurance oriented i think that is the way uh, the world is moving the uh, you know uh, the disclosures are also becoming more performance oriented and we are going certainly going to see from next financial year when the bs grs are disclosure the renewed disclosures will come from top uh, thousand I, I, uh, I i would request uh, i am done uh, with my session thank you uh, and uh, thank you anupam uh, so i would so request can, Uji to if you can take down the slides we can take down the slides yeah i will thank you so I think uh, um, you know, uh, Vikesh. I think uh, over back to you because uh, we have a bit of uh, challenge in terms of the time. So I would uh, uh, suggest that we take the questions towards the end. So as a concluding remark, I would just say that uh, you know, India as a country, we have a high risk, not just from a physical risk perspective, but also from a transitional perspective because many of the new technologies, new things which are identified as of now uh, i uh, you know in terms of the um, uh, technological know how and many of those kind of things uh, it's it's kind of a level playing field nobody has kind of mastered any of these things but i think it's it's kind of very important for us to realize that that transition is also a risk the physical risks are high as a, a, a country as well so i think uh, this should be factored into many of the discussions uh, as the uh, companies are planning in terms of their risk management and uh, the way forward business plans and all those things so i think uh, we uh, we would stop this panel uh, here thank you so much. we go to the next uh, session uh, we guess you over to you thank you thank you Thank you so much, Santoshi. I sincerely appreciate your on uh, the timing and uh, better time management. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are. Okay, good. Ravi, please add Thara TK to host. I think she has exited or she has been denied entry there. So, Thara, if you are listening, please rejoin, re-log in. Otherwise, uh, Ravi, please speak to Tara and invite her to re log in. Fine, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, I think now we move to the next uh, uh, next topic and next uh, session, which is uh, BRSR, time to reimagine our annual reporting. And for this, we have got with us a very, very good panel comprising of our chairperson for the uh, panel, which is uh, none other than Mr. Narayan Jayaprakash. He is the chief executive officer of Century Pulse and Paper, and also a master class alumni. Paper and pulp business has always led to discussions on environment and sustainability. Our chair of session, on BRSR, Mr. Narayan Jabrakash, a chief executive officer of Century Park and Paper, a division of Century Textiles and Industries Limited. He has an excellent academic record and very enriched work experience, including managing various uh, PNL of the businesses. And uh, he has in the past worked with FMCD businesses as well. And Mr. Narayan has received accreditations at national and international levels. He has been awarded the Uh, he's highly passionate about CSR work and gives his personal time as well. Rest in his group, we have got Mr. Arvind Bodhankar, who needs no introduction. Dr. Arvind Bodhankar is a very sought after speaker, and he's currently the joint executive president, chief sustainability officer at Ultra Tech Cement and Aditya Bilip Company. And he also contributes to industry level and various forums in one way or the other on, on matters of TSR, sustainability, 
HSC sustainability leaders, and all these things he has been contributing in a big way. Second speaker is Tara TK. She is a co-founder and CEO of ESG Minds. For successful implementation of ESG and SDGs down the line, the government and private sector require huge enabling capacity, and that's exactly what Tara TK has done under the chairmanship of Mr. Sarish Hervalpi by co-founding ESG Minds. She is a true ESG thought leader, strategist, solution architect, contributing in the system across corporates, governments, and academia as well. With over two decades of career experience with TCS as head travel transportation and hospitality in TCS Canada as the head and also in North America, she brings huge depth and hands-on experience in travel, transportation, hospitality, and domain uh, with the global customers across US, Canada, Europe, and these markets. Mr. Ravi Krishnamurti is our next speaker in the same group. He brings very rich experience. Ravi is the president at SBI Live, and uh, he is very, very sought after speaker and is very passionate about ESG, sustainability, and SDG. 37 years in building profitable BSF businesses across banking, insurance sectors. He has worked in SBI, he has worked in ICICI, and I think we are finding some bandwidth issues as it comes to the case side. So we are just trying to connect with it. In the interest of time, it may be useful to continue with the session. Let's just jump into it because otherwise we will be waiting for each other. Please, please take charge. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, uh, thank you very much, I think, uh, and uh, my special thanks to IOD, Vikesh, and Shishwai, you have given us the opportunity to express our view, especially on this honorable platform. Thank you very much. So I'm starting with the note that, uh, especially on PRSR, what this panel is going to describe, what this panel is going to cover. So my panel here is going to cover the journey of PSR, when this journey has started in this country, how the corporate or the business houses has taken it forward, why we are taking about, talking about the BSR, uh, BRSR reporting, BSR, BRSR status in the various industries, benefit and challenges in the various industries while implementation of this process in the business houses and key drivers basically, what will be the benefit to the businesses after this reporting and once this will get implemented in the in the Indian houses. So in this panel, first of all, uh, I would like to cover that, that in, you can say the initial journey will be covered by me. And why this reporting, that's also being covered by me and the status in various industry will be covered by Tara TK, TK that is, I think that she's covering the overall industry uh, Dr. Ravind is covering the manufacturing space. Ravi is covering financial industries. How this BRSR is going to impact these industries, and benefited and benefits and challenges will be covered by the various eminent speakers during their uh, terms. And the key drivers in the various sector will also will be discussed with them. So I'm starting with the journey. That it's not that the BRSR or the BRR has started, you can see the recent back. The journey has started 12 years back when MCA has announced the, you can say, the voluntary guidelines to the industry houses in 2009. In two, June 2011, UN guiding principle has come on business and human rights, where India has given the endorsement at that. And June 2011, MCA has given the new framework for the social and environmental reporting. 2012, MCA has asked first 100 industries 
to report the social and the environmental work what they are doing. In the year of 15-16, I think MC has extended that limit from 100 to 500 corporates to list this, you can say the social work, but till now it was a volunteer. There was a no mandatory cap on that. 2018, I think MC has formed one committee under the leadership of a joint secretary that is on 14th November 2018 and the assignment to that, you know, committee was to find or finalize the framework that how the, this, you can say the business responsibility work should come into the platform, come into the picture in a sustainable reporting format. So there it start the, you can say the BRSR and the, that committee has come with the various recommendations. Right. And once that committee has come with various recommendations, same time in 1920, MC has asked the top thousand corporates to report the business responsibility. You can say the outcome and reporting along with their annual report. Once that that committee has given that report on 11th August 2020, and they have come up with the certain recommendations. And those recommendations are that that all the business houses which are reporting now, they will have to fill the comprehensive PRSR report, whereas the other, those who are not familiar with the, this reporting, they have to for, adopt the another format that is a light version and start reporting that. They had come with the recommendation that whatever the reporting data is getting collected, it should be get connected with the MCA portal and there should be a formation of index of sustainability for the corporate houses so that whenever there will be a procurement, you can say the, the government procurement will take place, the preference will be given to those business houses who has got a good track record or who has got a high scoring into the business sustainability index. And they have come up with the recommendation that there should not be any unnecessarily compliances in that report so that the business should feel difficulty in that. And it should be in, in terms of all the language and easily understandable. So those are the, you can say, benefit and the committee has given those recommendations and this is the entire journey of BRR to BSR, BRSR. So now it comes that why, why this reporting, why, why this reporting has become mandatory now, why it's taking a so much speed now in the business houses. Because the key driver of this BRSR reporting structures are not the regulator right now. They are asking that from next year it should be mandatory, but right now they are not the key driver. The key drivers are the investor. The key drivers are the society. The society and the investors are pushing the business houses that if you are not doing sustainable business, I think we are going away from you. The market. The business houses will we are not going business houses are not going to see the market capitalization or the valuation there you can say the your organization if they are not approaching the sustainable base and this committee has also given a recommendation that all the company has to work on a nine pillar of esg and those all the you can say the element under those nine pillars has to be reported in this reporting structure they have asked the time that it should start from next year and should come get completed uh, by in, in the next five years, but not make the mandate. So now, since I have got in my panel members along with me, so I will request. Uh, I'm not seeing Tara in the panel right now. I think she got disconnected. So there I she's think... come back. You, you, we can get her in. She's just come back. I can see her. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah. Yeah. Tara, yeah. So I, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Right when we started, yeah, I got back. disconnected. Thank you. No Thank problem. you, Nari. Welcome. So, welcome. Back. So what I request you, you to, yeah, what I request you to take you through us to the, you can say the entire spe industry spectrum that how BRSR as well as the ESG is doing in the entire industry space, and what are your view in that, uh, that how you see that that how it's going to fare in the next uh, five to 10 years. Sure. Thank you, Nareen. You have brought the story to a point from where I can seamlessly take it and go to the next part of the story. Thank you, Nareen. 
And thank, thank you, Ayori, for today and uh, this wonderful panel of speakers. It has been an amazing day so far. Uh, so, coming to this topic of BRSR, we heard from the creator already, Mr. Amajit Singh. It's quite uh, good to hear from why the, the reasons and the context under which SEBI has come up with the format, right? And then he also said the ball is now in your court. So I'm taking the ball and then reflecting back on as one of the uh, stakeholders and one of the respondents from the ecosystem, reflecting back on how we feel and how we see BRSR is. So I have three parts to this point of view that I want to share with you today. Number one about India being one of the first few countries to mandate sustainability reporting, right? So early this year, I was quite surprised to see in a report where India topped among uh, 52 countries the, uh, wherein companies include sustainability in their uh, annual reporting. And it was a report from uh, KPMG and it covered uh, top 100 companies from each of these 52 countries in the report. And then I found the reason right behind that chart. And that was a comment from Mr. Santosh Jaram, which explained why we are there. It is because of the BRR, and plus, because of the 2% spent mandated on CSR and the related reporting that has secured us that position in that, that there. And then yet in another one, one more report from, I think it is Carrots and Stakes, which again position India among top 20 countries having maximum number of reporting sustainability reporting provisions. So with now, and so what well, the point that I'm trying to make is India is undoubtedly among one of those countries uh, where we have very uh, some, uh, matured sustainability reporting practices. Now with BRSR, we are potentially going to win some more of those top positions in these studies, right? Then many people may ask this question, what is really needed? Do we need really to do, do this? Are we overdoing this, right? After all, we are one of the lowest, we have one of the lowest uh, per capita emission, um, carbon emission in the world and lowest, uh, lower than any of the developed countries. Why do we have to push it so much, right? And I have tried to ask this question to myself and uh, my answer is, and because I often get asked about this, I get challenged about this. Why are we pushing it so much sustainability? Why is it on the top of the world right now? So I had to find, try and find the right answers for myself. And my answer is yes, absolutely. This is in our best interest to get started with this initiative right away for the ultimate reason of climate impact, climate change. So climate action to me has two parts to it. Part one is about how we bend the emission curve, right? And part two is about how do we prepare ourselves to face the consequences? How do we prepare ourselves to build the resilience that we need or build the, uh, the, uh, the whatever is the consequences that we are going to face, how are we ready for it, right? particularly very clearly, very important for developing countries like us. I'm not sure how many of you will agree with me when I say that um, a better planet is a hope which is at least 100 years away. The target that we are trying to reach, right, the 1.5 degree and the 2 degree that we are trying to achieve, which is, uh, which is at least four or five times worse than where we are today now. Even if the entire country is, if we, we do not have the right set of solutions and commitments from all the countries to meet those targets right now. Let's assume that even if we do un some, take some unprecedented measures, the world comes together and we are able to meet that, it's going to be another four or five times worse than where we are today. So the consequences are given in terms of food insecurity, water scarcity, in terms of the related social and economic imbalance, it's going to come to us. So we need to prepare ourselves with right set of solutions, right set of actions, right set of technology to face these, right? And without being dependent on any other country. And that's exactly why BRSR was important for us. And it is the right move and uh, uh, it's it's rightly positioned. It, it, it has a great potential to take us through our net zero economy journey. So that brings me to the part two of the point of view that I wanted to share, which is what has, how has life changed from BRR to BRSR? So Mr. Amarjit Singh has already given his perspective. If I go a little technical on that and reflect back as a consultant on that, whereas BRR and BRSR were served, and first look, they are all built on the same set of principles. Where it has significantly become different is the way it quantifies things, right? If I, for a comparison, if I want to just rate these two structures, BRR would score about two to three on a scale of 10, and BRSR would 
score about seven to eight in its ability to quantify and qualify things. From a coverage perspective, again, they both are covering same towers, but BRSR has gone extensive in the tower of environment, human rights, um, community, uh -huh. and employees. And when it, if you want to compare with where does it stand with respect to global frameworks, if like any other report, BRSR is also a subset of GRI, which is the mother of all reports, right? And last year, if you remember, World Economic Forum had put this, um, uh, has brought together the big fours, and then they made the first ever attempt of consolidating the reporting frameworks available there. And BRSR almost 100% overlaps with the top 21 mandated requirements and disclosures that is put in place by World Economic Forum too. And it has a great overlap with TCFD, which is the most uh, followed report of when it comes to climate action. So yes, it is very much in line with the global disclosing uh, disclosure standards that we have in place. So in a nutshell, it is a good, great framework which can help us compare the businesses on their approaches and the performance. And coming to the third part of my conversation, which is about how can we, how will BRSR help us in reimagining the annual reporting? So in the last few years, if you see the introduction of integrated reporting and the whole focus that we have brought on to sustainability, annual reports have immensely transformed in the way they tell the stories, right? And as a consultant, I keep looking into the annual reports very regularly to see the, how the story is being narrated and how do we decipher the communication through the eyes of different stakeholders. And from that point, the top three things that comes to my mind, how BRSR can support our, uh, the reimagination of annual report will be number one, truly bringing an integrated storyline. So today, most companies are comfortable or they prefer to keep their sustainability reporting separate and their annual reporting separate. These are two separate reports from them. Although it, is, it, it feels fine to look for additional details in a separate report, the two issues that I face with this approach is number one, when the information is represented in two different uh, reports, they often tend to contradict each other. So which is a huge hit on the trust factor. And number two, some of the greatest sustainability messages get sidelined onto your sustainability reporting. If sustainability is so important for us, if there are so many stakeholders looking into it, why do we want to miss it from our annual reporting, right? From that point of view, an integrated storytelling covering the financial and non-financial dimensions would go a great long way in building that big picture and building that trust. I totally believe that BRSR has the potential to establish this practice of talking sustainability very comprehensively and conclusively and completely within the annual report itself. That could be one change we will see in the coming years. Number two, presenting relevant and relatable information. Today, whether it is your traditional annual report or your integrated report, the choice is left to the report writer to decide what is relevant and what is relatable. Even integrated report, it's like a big bag, right? With a lot of pockets in it. You can put the information into each or any of the pockets following a guideline. So it is not prescriptive, it is just principle-based. Whereas BRSR is a set of very prescriptive disclosures. And thereby, it is going to completely um, uh, complement an integrated report. And that will be nice combinations to see the uh, principle-based um, structure and uh, prescriptive content within it. So it has all the potential to take us to that level. Number three, how BRSR will bring consistency. Consistency of messages, not only within your annual report, but across all the communications channels that we look at, right? Earlier, we didn't have enough data to see whether the messaging that is written on the story is true or not. We have to believe it or perceive or makes our perceptions, right? Now BRSR is going to give us the data and we need to write the story complementing with the data and it cannot be contradictory. And if it is contradicting, that will be one of the ways that it will be looked at that it is greenwashing. So BRSR is going to hopefully push us to give consolidated and complementing story of messaging and data. So eventually when I look at it, if there is action, the story naturally flows. It is interconnected, it is integrated, it is complete, it is concise, it is clear. So it looks like action along with the storytelling, the a strong bridging to communication is the way to go on annual reporting. So that's all I wanted to share about BRSR. Thanks, Mary.
Thanks, Sarah. I think you have covered it very comprehensively. So our next panelist is Dr. Arvind. Dr. Arvind comes from the manufacturing space. And uh, I will request doctor to cover uh, all the manufacturing, you know, journey of BRSR along with the, you know, challenges and the benefit in the manufacturing industry. So over to you, Dr. Arvind. already covered a lot on BRSR and uh, there is hardly anything left out for me because it will be a repetition but as you ask the question uh, what are the challenges uh, for the manufacturing industry on reporting let me try and answer that in a very brief manner uh, I started my journey as a sustainability professional uh, somewhere around when, uh, when the Kyoto, uh, Kyoto protocol was signed up and I have been struggling to find the right definition of sustainability. And then eventually I found out a definition. Uh, sustainability is creating value for the stakeholders. And uh, manufacturing sector has, uh, I think, highest number of stakeholders, maybe eight or nine, right from your uh, suppliers to uh, you know consumers to people to community uh to uh to regulators uh to investors shareholders uh, eight or nine to union uh, i mean uh, opinion makers so you and you need to satisfy each of these stakeholders then only your business can be sustainable and you just think of let's say for example if your people are not satisfied what will happen to your business if your suppliers are not satisfied what will happen to your business and this satisfaction, while uh, there have been a number of efforts being uh, uh, taken at the manufacturing level to keep this satisfaction, uh, to keep the stakeholders satisfied, maybe in a structured manner, maybe knowingly and unknowingly, the word which was used earlier, unconscious sustainability, unconsciously, uh, manufacturing sector has been trying to do that. And uh, the one of one tool which we have to communicate the value which we have created is the sustainability report. Uh, manufacturing sector has been pioneers. I was fortunate to have worked with companies like Birla, Tata's, uh, Cadbury's, who have been pioneers in uh, publishing the sustainability report. In fact, Tata Group published the first sustainability. Tata Automotive published the first sustainability report way back in 2001 even when number of global players did not publish that. And also uh, now also I have been almost 50 for the last 15 years, I have been publishing sustainability report. Uh, sustainability report, of course, it was voluntary kind of thing. Uh, and uh, I was just struggling, you know, I participated in many panel discussion, maybe at National Stock Exchange, maybe at Bombay Stock Exchange. And every time when the question used to come, how, why people are not proactively reporting, uh, doing the sustainability reporting. And uh, a couple of years back, the number was somewhere around 78, 79. I don't know today's number, but it's still around or less than 100. And not many companies are coming forward and reporting. And then I tried to uh, uh, drill down on this and found out that, uh, you know, first of all, uh, the challenge which these companies are facing is it takes enormous of time uh, to prepare a report and initially especially when you are new to the uh, sustainability reporting it takes minimum three to four months to collect the data and if you have multi-site organization it may take more, much more than that and then after that you need to get validated that data and right way of communicating also is very important so initially if you are working on this it may consume easily seven to eight months of your time the first report may come up somewhere around October, November. That's what I had seen. Uh, so a lot of time is consumed. That's one uh, uh, area of constraint or the challenge which people are facing. The another area of challenge is, uh, uh, you know, is around communicating. Uh, uh, transparency, in fact, I, I, I keep uh, uh, sharing this anecdote. Uh, a student who is not bright enough in the class, and if he, if people have been, if the students have been asked to uh, disclose their last year's uh, uh, performance or the percentage. And if it is voluntary, perhaps that student may not, uh, 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 you know, disclose. But if the moment it is made mandatory, 
uh, then uh, you know he will have to disclose that I am a uh, you know 45 percent, 48 percent. Uh, but that will embarrass him and that will, uh, uh, in fact, challenge him to work. And then eventually we may find that he may uh, come out to be a bright student. So manufacturing industry has to look into many times. I have seen that when we have to report the posh related cases, when we have to report the corruption related cases, when we have to report the business uh, code of conduct related cases, we are reluctant. And uh, the questions are being asked, is it mandatory to do that? Is it necessary? Can you avoid doing that? And uh, has somebody forced you to do that? That kind of questions being asked to the sustainability professionals or the uh, company secretaries or whosoever is in charge of publishing those reports. Uh, so manufacturing sector has that challenge, you know, on communicating and how it will be perceived by the stakeholders. Now, not necessary that every time this will be perceived in a very positive manner or uh, in a. So that's one uh, uh, challenge or that's one barrier for. Uh, manufacturing companies to communicate on uh, the uh, sustainability or uh, to do the sustainability reporting. But having BR, BRSR made mandatory, now of course you have to keep on uh, uh, communicating on that whether you are good or bad. And I, I can clearly see that if you are a bad uh, one, uh, initially you may remain bad, but that will definitely push you uh, to improve uh, within uh, yourself and uh, eventually you will emerge to be a winner uh, one point of time that will definitely attract uh, uh, investors uh, uh, to your organization and uh, uh, also that will provide you a better brand uh, image. Uh, so I think that's the uh, uh, manufacturing sector needs to look at uh, reporting on BS BRSR or sustainability reporting. I'll take a pause and if you have any supplementary question, uh, uh, I mean, I can answer that. Uh, Dr. Albin, I have got another question that in the coming time when investors are pressing the, you can say the business houses to, you can say, disclose all their, you know, all the numbers in statistical forms. And once they are comparing the performance of any business houses and the manufacturing takes a bigger space in any business. I'm sure that the future will be entirely different and there will be a lot of pressure on the, you know, manufacturing uh, operations. So how do you see that in the future, whether the Indian manufacturing houses or the Indian, Indian manufacturing setups are ready for that or it has got a challenges yet? So it has got a challenges and as uh, as uh, Ms. Rina was uh, talking about, if we want to meet the climate change related commitments, we may have to spend about 170 billion dollars uh, 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 year on year to meet those challenges. Obviously, those companies who are not doing business uh, outside India or those who are doing businesses within in India and they have to, the, the, those are dependent on technologies, they will have to pass on this financial burden uh, to the consumers, which are the Indian people. Now, that will be in the form of price hike and ultimately, in fact, it is going to impact your own economy. So that's the challenge is always going to be there, especially for the Indian companies. And that's why when we talk about net zero and all, of course, this is not the uh, 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 platform where I should be talking about it, but there has to be a common but differentiated responsibility and which I have been advocating for that. And uh, uh, you need to have provide the uh, financial assistance to the Indian companies to make meet those commitment. Uh, but definitely it is going to be challenging when they ask, uh, uh, especially in, in the, uh, uh, in uh, to fund the companies, if they want to disclose more and more on uh, this thing, it's going to be a uh, challenging for Indian industry. But there are there are way out of this, and my own company has done it. We had floated up uh, 400 billion sustainability bond very recently. We are the first in the India to do that in dollar denomination, and our issue got oversubscribed. Uh, so as long as you show the intent, as long as you show the uh, roadmap to them, they believe in you. And people are uh, respond. People are subscribing to whatever uh, you are doing. Uh, I can tell you, our issue got three times over subscribe, and most of the UNPRI signatories have uh, uh, made investment in our company. You name the one, CAS hundred companies have invested. So there are ways and means to handle that also. Uh, but there will, there is definitely going to be a challenge. Thanks, uh, Dr. Arvind. Thank you very much. I think sustainability is not only a challenge, but it's I think it's a revenue generation stream also in future. 
if the witness can translate it nicely with this word, I, I'm taking the wall to Ravi. Ravi, please, uh, I think, give your reflections actually on uh, financial sector. How, how do you see the VRFR effect, distillation, or the benefit uh, to the financial sector? And what's your reflection, especially the implementation of this concept in the financial sector, especially in the insurance? Over to you. Yeah, thank you so much uh, to the Institute of Directors, uh, Sri Vikesh Ji, and uh, all the speakers, the eminent speakers. And I'm really happy to be in of uh, very distinguished speakers, uh, including uh, Shailesh Hari Bhakti Ji, and then our industry leader, Mr. Kumar's uh, presence here has definitely added a lot of value to us. Uh, I had operated in both the public sector and the private sector, banking as well as the life insurance sector. And uh, when I looked at uh, the BRSR reporting, and the topic today was reimagining reporting. So today, integrated financial reporting through the IFRS is becoming a reality in terms of numbers in terms of transparency but what does brsr do to the sector it brings a dimension of quality and in a banking and insurance sector which is basically a sector where the product is not tangible unlike manufacturing industry people perceive the product people perceive the offering over a period of time at the time of acquisition, at the time of onboarding, the customer perceives our offering differently. At the time of maturity, he, he perceives it differently. At the time of various pro servicing, during the life cycle of the product, is it differently. And therefore, the intangibility of the service of the product in the banking and the financial services sector, particularly banking and life insurance, because life insurance is pretty long term. And if you look at sustainability, and rightly Mr. Kumar mentioned about sustainability becoming an unconscious effort in it, because by definition, life insurance contracts are long. They are lasting more than 15 to 20 years. And many a time, at the time of maturity, the customer has even forgotten what was promised to him at the time of buying the product to that extent. And people don't read long contracts. In that case, what BRSR does is brings to the, the value of trust. How do you quantify trust? People talk about brand valuation, but in this BRSR, you have an excellent opportunity to actually strategize how to build brand value of an organization. So while the history of the past is told in the balance sheets, the future is contained in how you look at the brand of an organization. And the excellent opportunity of BRSR is, uh, Mr. Amarjit Singh rightly mentioned that the ball is in our court. The reporting format and the matrix is given. But then what do you do with that matrix? And I would say that the best way to do it is years back uh, in 2011-12, a uh, lot of persuasion came to us as a young fledgling company when SBA Life was growing that we felt that we should apply for the Ramkrishna Bajaj National Quality Award. What I felt it is a huge introspective journey. An introspective journey where questions get asked by ourselves. How do we see in the entire BFSS sector? There are three main components. One is the customer, which is most important. The second is the distributor is the society at large. And let me give you an example as to how leadership and governance play a very critical component in establishing brand value and establishing long term sustainable trust with customers. Yes. And the way forward was during the exercise with Ramkrishna Bajaj, we understood that there is no shortcut to this, but actually to start asking, how do we do this? What does the metrics tell us? What does customer, we usually look at, for example, net promoter score. But here in the, in the process of learning, we realized that it is not the net promoter score that matters. What matters is what does dissatisfaction tell us? And what is the various strata of society telling them? If there are complaints, what does the lower profile customer tell us? What does the higher profile customer tell us? So is our understanding of the customer so as to be able to redesign our products, redesign our processes, redesign our offerings in such a way that it meets the aspirations of a wider society. So some are customers with us, some are future prospects with us. 
the society when i mentioned society the customer is a subset of society today a few people are customers but tomorrow a whole lot of people society is watching to see what do the customers say about a particular company and whether they are happy with the product so i say that dissatisfaction customer loyalty do customers buy only one product or do they buy more than one product what is the percentage of people who buy more than one product in this company that kind of tells us whether the loyalty index is being built with the company assiduously whether people are willing to buy more than one financial product with a particular bank or an insurance company similarly we try to see what is their claim payment record how fast do they pay what percentage of claims get paid what what is the turnaround time for payments how is the responsive responsiveness of the call centers what is the responsiveness of the internet banking is the website say for example is it equipped to handle say braille it's very important because so do disadvantaged sections how are differently able, able to approach digitally an organization to buy a product or service a product and these many these are and the other things suppose you are selling products suppose you have got 14 products with you what is the diversity to the customer base to which you are selling are you selling to a wide segment of customer are you selling a wide set of products and that brings in a sense of inclusiveness a sense of equity a sense of fairness in the organization that it is able to conceive a product to every strata of society and that is the journey for most of the banking and the financial sectors to see whether the products that they are offering is truly equitable fair transparent and whether the product segment is able to cater to various needs of strata of society and that is why that we bring into play when we work on sustainability are not around a total gross number the total what is the top line but to see as to how many products are getting sold what percentage of people buy what kind of product how much of the people with the lower strata of society how much do they buy how much micro insurance products are sold this kind of gives understanding to the society whether there is fairness in the way the organization handles is it an organization which is niche or is it equitable and is it catering to a larger segment of society let me come to distributors we always think of a customer but who's the person who meets the customer in life insurance for example it is a distributor so one of the ways by which you can look at sustainability is how many of the distributors stick to that organization do distributors leave so one of the quantifiable metrics would be what is your percentage of attrition of distributors how many distributors leave you so if the distributors leave you customers will leave you sooner or later so what is the inclusivity of the distributor do you have distributors from all status of society to cater to all needs of society similarly when you come to employees what kind of training you give what is the percentage of attrition what is the percentage of career or organization are getting what kind of talent are you attracting what is the diversity of your employee pool do you attract people from all the genders are you able to attract people from the women gender also equally well are you attractive enough to the semi urban area are you an attractive enough to get people from the rural areas also are people from all walks of life feeling comfortable to work with the organization so there are metrics which you can develop in order to make sure that equity fairness transparency openness of the organization is measured in quantifiable terms and then you look at the training for example in an organization learning and development are the one of the most crucial aspect what kind of training do you give what are the quantifiable metrics by which you know whether there is meaningful impact and brsr is all about measuring the meaningful impact of your products and services and of your presence in the society and what kind of csr you do what are the measurable impacts of your csr in terms of uh, planet greening in terms of carbon for example even in bfsa sector though it's not a manufacturing industry and we don't do really effluents but see there are very very innovative methods of helping carbon credit one of the ways is what kind of investments do you do what kind of lending do you do to industries where do you lend to how much percentage of green industries how much of percentage of your investments are in green bonds and how much of your invest or activities of social contribution how much of it is for a renewable energy water conservation or forest 
conservation or tree planting. So in varieties of ways in CSR, in societal, as well as distributed development in terms of customer acquisition and in terms of green initiatives in terms of digitization, which our LIC chairman so well expressed that a simple initiative scaled up with the right intent has created so much of a big platform that when the COVID epidemic came, I think work from home became very easy for the bank services sector because they were very well prepared. And I would leave one point uh, to think. Uh, every reporting, every new regulation can become a mere reporting or could become only a statutory mandatory reporting unless the organization itself intrinsically believes that this is a wonderful tool for me to reimagine my reporting and strategy around that. Uh, I would pause for a minute uh, uh, to uh, request Mr. Narayan if he has any questions to ask me on uh, how to make this more valuable for us. Thanks, Ravi. I think uh, covered very comprehensively and my questions to you is, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. My question to you that, uh, see, your industry is entirely different than the manufacturing setup where the, you can say the visions are there, influence are there, and they are generating other ways that they can work. You can say that tangibly people can see that. But how, once this reporting will be mandatory to your organization, how it will display it as a benefit to your industry? Can you describe that? So I was going through uh, a few sustainability reports of uh, both Indian uh, banking and insurance companies, as well as global companies like New York Life or Tata AIG, uh, AIG or Citibank. And what I found was very interesting that uh, while the creation of carbon may be very less from a banking sector or an insurance sector, the ability to fund specific green greening green energy projects is tremendous. For example, perhaps I saw one of the speakers speak about carbon calculator. I think uh, if banks were funding a versatile set of industries, you could actually get to know what kind of carbon get created and then decide how much carbon creation is being caused by the lending and then decide what will be your CSR focus as to how much of that will get compensated by way of your CSR activity to reduce that or compensate that. Though, though the banking or the insurance sector per se doesn't create carbon, its lending activities to manufacturing industries can be dovetailed in such a way it encourages more of activities towards green energy. And the other thing which uh, is which occurs to me is in order to make this more meaningful, one of the best things is the reporting flows out of your strategy and not that at the time of reporting, you retrofit your initiatives into the reporting. In fact, uh, to be very fair, I was uh, looking at most of the reports in recent time, which is anyway today voluntary, but I was watching how the ESG reports currently get uh, done. And what I felt was that you sometimes, it's, a, it's an afterthought to you that whatever initiative I took was anyway a CSG initiative. I think it should be the other way around that you project into the future, create a board strategy specifically on ESG, specifically on BRSR, and you know voluntarily come out with a set of initiatives that you will take for the next 12 months and measure against the set of initiatives that you are yourself committed to. So in that way, what happens is the reporting becomes not a formality, or a sudden afterthought of retrofitting an initiative into the report, but more effort that you will create sustainability for the organization, you will create sustainability for the customer and to the society at large. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, let me conclude now. I think we are also hard pressed with the time. So to what, what we are saying that, uh, thanks uh, Dr. Ravin, thanks Para, thanks uh, Ravi Krishnamurti to covering this topic very comprehensively. Thank you very much. And in the conclusive note, what I'm concluding that once this reporting will become mandatory, I think the key driver will be the regulator and the investor. In previous, we have seen that in certain area, only the regulators are the only drivers because it was not connected with the financial outcome. But the BRSR report is connected with the financial outcome because the investors are going to press you very hard in the investor made 
once they are doing the benchmarking with your competitors. And you cannot fit with this data because this is this may, may become contradictory because you are finding somewhere around 650 to 700 inputs and one input is uh, related with other one. And once you are finding something other other hand, you are getting compared with your competitor. So you have got a many responsibilities in the market. So what I'm anticipating that it will be implemented very fast as compared what we have seen, which is being driven by the regulators or you can manage the regulators. So that will not be the case in case of VR SR reporting. Okay. So with this word, I'm concluding this panel discussion. And in the end, I'm thankful to Bikesh Bhai and I'm thankful to Shailesh uh, Harivatyaji. And uh, thanks for the opportunity which you have given to us to present our view on BRS reporting and the timeline. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Javakashi. I'll request uh, uh, Mr. Hari Bhakti to kindly do a summary of the sessions that we have had, these two sessions and the earlier inaugural session. Sir, please. Thank you, Vikesh Bhai. I will also try and answer all the questions in the chat box. Um, so let me give you all, I started with three things that we need to do as citizens of India. Let me end with three ideas that we as a group, as a cohort who have attended this seminar, spoken and at it can do. Uh, the first thing we can do is sell the idea in the way that this last panel talked about it to our boards by actually giving them what might be the equivalent of a TEDx talk. So get ready for giving a TEDx talk to every board, every one of the 1000 boards in this country, which will have to voluntarily go for BRSR. That's my first uh, thought to share with all of you. And we need to have a whole cohort of people who will actually give this TEDx talk. So each one of us has the chance to put their hand up and say, I will do it. The second thought is that we need to truly believe that the future of all reporting is integrated reporting. And that the entire structure of accounting and reporting will switch to gathering data sets and making sense out of them in the context of the six capitals of integrated thinking. And so people like Milan should put their hands up to say that we will create the ERP of ESG. That is what the world needs. We need a complete methodology, a set of tools which will enable us to capture this. Because in seven years time, all accounting reporting will become continuous. Nobody will need to have a quarterly or an annual report. What we will need is once in a year, an integrated report, which talks about how have you influenced the six capitals. And that's the basis on which people will join your company. That's the basis on which people will invest in you, divest from you. Uh, governments will collect revenue from you. All of that will get automated because it will be a world full of repositories and quantum computing and brain computer interfaces and all the rest of it that Milan is a better expert on and all of you are better experts on. And the third thought I will leave for you to consider is that we need to create a Netflix of sustainability. You know, you can't explain all these dense stuff that we talked about throughout this three hours to the last man standing at your gate. You need to give him a Netflix like picture, which tells him how your heart goes out and touches him and makes him safer or her safer. Why do you care for her health? How do you make sure that you will be fair to everybody? How will you make sure that everybody gets a chance to actually participate? That's the story they want to hear. 
it's a netflix of sustainability that we all need to create together so those are my three thoughts now let's look at what we can do with the brsr okay so i had an i have an offer from an organization in singapore which is doing this stuff in singapore the uh, government there has mandated them to set up a platform which to which the entire singapore uh, community will upload their uh, gri reports okay and then rather than just depending on a score which is so non transparent and so non discriminatory you would be able to granularly decide like dr budankar talked about the 400 million issue how did the givers of that money actually decide that 400 million dollars are deserved by his organization they did it because they were able to diligence that organization's actual performance now what this platform can do if we get all our brsr reports onto one platform is to enable people to have much more than just that score which is very hard to decipher is not discriminating <coughs> to actually take the calls on who should be supported and granularly we should be able to in a descending order of actual relevance and future readiness and future um, orientedness we'll be able to rank all our 1000 companies and then we will go on to the 18 and a half lakh companies which exist in india so i see that as the future of sustainability reporting there's a whole amount of fabulously interesting work for everybody to do let's get engaged and yes brsr is a subset of gri gri has also to be mapped to sasb because gri speaks to a wide range of audiences whereas sasb speaks to the financial community and it is totally domain driven so that's the way the frameworks in the world have evolved but fortunately for us the value reporting foundation is going to bring both the gri and the sasb together and we will have a single set of things to do in no more than one year that's the timeline i believe that we'll have the value reporting foundations unified uh, protocol for communicating with all economic interests and by that time we would have seen the birth of the sustainability accounting standards board which will be a subset of the international accounting standards board so in all aspects we will have uniformity across the whole world because everybody who had got into the act of setting up standards and giving guidelines and giving all of that has come together and nobody wants to say that this is only my domain i think the final thought has struck the whole world that we are in this together so let's stay with that thought and let's work on that thought because this is our planet let's save it thank you thank you thank you very much sir thank you, thank you. so i think uh, as all good things have to come to an end also but this one will continue even if we are closing it today as mr hari bakshi yeah. has invited everyone to stay connected and to go forward on this i think this is going to be a never ending journey thank you very much so my word of thanks for all our uh, guest of honors chief guest keynote speaker all the panelists all the participants and everyone who has made this day so very successful to all of us thank you very much to all the sponsors lic nsdl and uh, nst century pulp and paper birla states all of them have supported us so hugely kpmg coming forward with santosh ji 
and all other speakers. I don't want to, I can't name each and every speaker because going to be for a shortage of time. So I think I can close here now and thanking everyone and the team IOD Mumbai and team IOD in Delhi and so many other people who have made this conference such a success. Thank you very much, everyone. Look forward to meeting you next quarter for RMD Mumbai's uh, regional program in the coming quarter. In between tomorrow, we have another very good program where Mr. Salish Haribhakti is going to join a very eminent panel of speakers. Tomorrow is a very, very special day for IOD. We have a very good program. Please join. The link has already been sent. And uh, yes, strategic foresight for boards shaping the future. It is going to happen tomorrow, 3 o'clock to 7 o'clock. It's going to be very, very interesting, very amusing, very challenging program. I would urge all of you to please join and listen to Salesh Ji in his futuristic mode. This is his sustainability mode. He has another mode of being futuristic and he does. He does give good hints, guidelines about how the future is going to shape up for the corporates, for the boards. And that's what now corporates have started looking up to him. Like there used to be sessions by Nani Palkiwala on budgets. I think we'll have to organize sessions for Mr. Hari Bhakti on innovation and on future. Thank you very much, everyone. And we look forward to staying connected. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Team Mumbai. Thank you, Team IoT Delhi. Everyone. Thank you. Play the videos, please. Yeah. So please join tomorrow, everyone. You are most heartily invited. Thank you so much. MSDL slide, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Ravi. Thank you so much, Samar. Thanks, Manoj, Preeti, Sharad, everybody, Pornima, and Anoop sitting in UP, wherever you are. Thank you very much, everyone.